Okay, great to have everybody on today. Welcome to the uh, meditation refresher and group meditation we got going on today. Today is Saturday, December 8th, 2018. So um, um, I'm recording this now for anybody who may want to listen again, or obviously there's those who may not be able to uh, be here live with us. So I do these, as you, as you know, as some of you may know, um, I do these regularly. I do it once a month anyway. Sometimes if I have a group meditation class, I'll invite all of you to join in um, as a quote-unquote refresher for the new people's class that, where it's a group class. Obviously, I, if it's a private class, then it's a private class, then <laughs> you're not invited. Don't take it personally. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's the way that works. And I've just been doing a lot more private classes lately um, just because for various reasons. Some people want the privacy, quite frankly. You know, they may have very personal issues, which, of course, we all respect, of, of course. Um, um, or they just may not want to wait. And that's uh, it's a, or a combo platter of, of, of several reasons. You know, they just don't want to wait till there's a group class coming up in the next month or two or something like that. And they want to get going and learning right away. So very often it's a combination of that. But I've been doing a lot more private classes, which is why if for those of you who have been with me for years now, you may have noticed a drop off on the number of refresher uh, invitations I'm giving you where there are new people on the class. So today we don't really have any new new people new people. Uh, we have some people on who've been meditating for a month, two months, or that kind of thing. Uh, relatively new, not like brand newbies. Okay. So that's what's going on um, in my life from a professional standpoint. Uh, I'm up here in Seattle also, just spoke at the Rainier Club, which is, I guess, it's the oldest private club. I was Wikipedia Wikipediaing it. That's a word uh, the other day, and um, uh, the oldest private club in in Seattle. So it's 1888. Anyway, I spoke there uh, to a estate planning council group of lawyers, accountants, financial uh, planners, financial consultants, um, people who are in uh, you know giving, you know donations, and giving charitable uh, work in large institutions like universities and hospitals and so forth. Um, so I spoke to a hundred of them, sold a bunch of books, almost all my books I sold that I brought. Uh, it was a great group and I'm still trying to get that uploaded. So just a heads up, I'll send that out. Uh, I'll be out posted on Facebook. It'll be on my website. So I'll let you know when I can get that uh, worked out with YouTube, uh, the uploading. So uh, that's going on. Another little snippet, uh, so Jane and others who are in L.A., uh, we should try to get together in the next couple of weeks because I'm going to start being bi-coastal starting on December 28th. I'm going to be living in Pennsylvania, spending a lot more time on the East Coast uh, for professional and personal reasons. And uh, so I'll be looking to set up speaking uh, engagements. So those of you who are on the East Coast, please keep that in mind and let's talk. Let's, you know, offline, obviously. Uh, let's get uh, put our heads together, and um, I, I'm talking to some folks down in the D.C., Virginia area, looking in Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I'll be speaking in New Jersey and doing some grief recovery work uh, in New Jersey uh, for sure. And then uh, the Boston uh, Norwood, where I grew up in Norwood, Massachusetts, in the Boston area and so forth. Um, let's think about uh, uh, another uh, follow-ups to stuff that I've done before and then maybe new, some new stuff. Okay. So that's what's going on in my life, personally, professionally. It's pretty exciting. And uh, um, so let's get on with the class today. So first of all, uh, I have some things that I want to cover uh, with you today in our refresher. And we're obviously going to always do a group meditation together. And so the way organizationally we'll do it is we'll take some questions from you folks first to see if folks have any questions, and then I think we'll, we'll end with a Q&A as well. Um, because, for a couple of reasons, we'll end with Q&A as well, because some of the stuff that we'll talk about may stir up questions. Uh, but also, um, I know there's at least a couple of, a few other people who are 
going to join late. So they may, I want to give them an opportunity to ask questions as well. Um, and it's always a great opportunity for all of, all of us, all of you and me. I'm always learning from er everything that you guys ask me, even though I'm the teacher and so forth, you know, it helps me reprocess uh, thinking about meditation in the different ways that you ask me. So you really, uh, as you know, yes, you're my students, my clients, whatever, but, but yeah, you, uh, you are an integral part of the really constant development evolution of the teaching of the technique, the way I teach it anyway, because I listen to you. I hear what you say. I hear questions you ask in a certain way. It causes me to reflect and think in a different way about the technique. And sometimes it actually affects the, the, the te my teaching of the technique in a, in, 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 in a subtle and then sometimes even more than subtle ways. So uh, over the decades, as I've been teaching for the last 45 years. You know. So uh, thank you for that and continue to probe yourself, myself, and so forth with your question. Okay. So why don't we, we're going to, so why don't we do this with we'll first, just open it up for Q and a to all of you. We've got about a dozen people or so on the call now. Um, and, um, and then we'll do a group meditation and then, I'll, and then I'll talk about some, uh, certain points I want to, I want to, I want to hit up, cover. Okay. So questions, anybody open the floor up. Um, okay. Feel free. And like I said, you can text in the uh, chat and yeah, text text as well. I have the text screen open here on my computer as well. I can see regular text. Okay. Anybody? Questions, technique, process, logistics, fitting it in, anything like that? There are no questions. I'll say a couple of things before we meditate. Okay. All right. And feel free to interrupt me. This is always informal. You guys know me. All right. So here's the thing. Um, one thing I want to touch on is the idea of consistency. So those of you who've been meditating, some of you have been meditating for 30, 40 years. Some of you have been meditating for five or 10 years. I'm looking at the list of names of people. Um, and, you know, some of you have been meditating a few months, two, three, four months. Okay, we have this huge range of, of length of people. Uh, people have been meditating on the call right now, and um, thing is, bottom line is consistency of technique. Now, what do I mean by that? Consistently practicing it on a ideally daily basis, twice a day. That's the ideal. But this is guilt-free meditation, and I say that jokingly but very seriously. This is not about, oh, wow, I missed a meditation today, uh, and you start, like, punishing yourself or feeling really badly about that. No, this is guilt-free meditation. This is my all of my work, whether it's teaching meditation or my overcoming the fear of death work or my grief recovery work. It's all about reducing fears in people, right? Reducing stuff that contracts us as human beings, in order to increase uh, the enjoyment. So my goal is to increase the enjoyment and happiness that we experience in life. So the last thing I want you to do is feel guilty about missing a meditation, okay? So if you miss, you miss. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Just move on. But you want to be as consistent as possible with it. Why? Because we are developing familiarity in our pathways. So I want to say this a couple of different ways to you. And whichever way sinks in and strikes you and resonates with you, great. Um, so here's one way to think of it. Think about we're developing familiarity in the neuro pathways of our brain functioning, literally, and our blood and our brain chemistry and so forth. So, and, and by consistently exposing our nervous system to this slightly different style of functioning that we happen to label and call meditation, turning within meditation, meditation, whatever you want to call this, by doing that on a regular basis, we are developing a familiarity in our nervous system. What does that do? That allows the nervous system to more and more and more quickly, more readily, more effectively turn on what you hear me, you've heard me talk about as the opposite of the fight or flight switch, right? We want to turn on the opposite of the fight or flight switch. Why? To, to balance out the fight or flight switch. 
which gets turned on way too much in our in our cultures worldwide. By the way, you know, I've worked with people from 27 countries so far uh, in the last several years. It's really mushroomed in terms of exposure on the internet. But but you know, it's it doesn't matter where you live. Everybody's overloaded by the fight or flight. We need to balance it by turning on the opposite of the fight or flight switch. And the, the medical term for that is the parasympathetic nervous system. So you can Google that. I don't need to get into the details of it now, but you can Google that yourself, parasympathetic nervous system. Well, that's what we're turning on. That's what the technique that I'm teaching, that I've taught you, turns on. And when it turns on, on all kinds of good benefits cascade, right? All kinds of balancing occurs, stress, anxiety releases, and so forth. All of that good stuff. Well, by developing a familiarity with that pathway of turning that on in our neuro, neurophysiology, what happens is it starts to turn on more and more automatically. Now, how many of you have noticed that you have uh, been sometimes just sitting quietly with your eyes closed, not even using the sound, and it seems like you just meditated, right? Well, that's exactly yep. what I'm talking about, right? You've noticed that sometimes, right? Right. Yep. I have. Yep, exactly. And so what's that? That's a, that's that's the real-life example of what I just said. Where you develop that familiarity, the nervous system starts to turn on the switch automatically. Well, that's what, you know, when I learned TM back, way back, as you know, I don't teach TM per se anymore, but I, but I give credit to Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, who taught me and uh, taught me how to teach it. And, um, and that was his gift to the world. The fact that this is, this, this process is easy. Um, it, it's effortless or could, should be, and could be effortless. That's his gift to the world. Well, the effortlessness of the process is the beauty of it. And I've made it even easier over the years, thanks to you and some of the uh, tips, and, and, you know, questions you've posed to me that made me think and go, huh, that's interesting. I've changed the technique, make it easier. But the point is that the easier the technique, the faster you turn on this, this, fight or, this opposite of the fight or flight switch, the parasympathetic nervous system switch. And that creates this naturalness. So that is, I think it was Jane just said, automatic. It's just automatic. You just close yeah. your eyes sometimes and boom. Or you, or anybody, yeah. anybody notice when you go to sleep at, or, or you just take a nap. You lie down, you take a nap, and you get up. And it's like, oh, I feel like I just meditated. I didn't think the sound or anything. I didn't do a quote-unquote technique, right? Yep. Yep, right? I, I, that was going to be it. That was going to be my question today. What if you just close your eyes and don't do the sound? And you know, because I do get that benefit, even if it's like for a minute and a half, two minutes. Yep, I do. Yep. Thank you for covering that. Absolutely. No, I'll sit literally. Uh, I'll sit in Santa Monica at my dentist's office, waiting to get my teeth cleaned because I get my teeth cleaned like uh, you know several times a year. And 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 I'll sit there in the waiting room. You know. You go to a doctor's office of any kind, whether it's a dentist room, it's, you're always waiting, right? That's one guarantee is that they'll never take you as soon as you walk in. It doesn't matter how early you get there or late you get there. They're just like, it's like, okay, you got to wait. So, so you sit and close your eyes. I do that all the time, you know? And I just close my eyes, just like you said, Jane. I don't close my eyes. I'm not thinking, boom, but I'm meditating, okay? The parasympathetic nervous system gets turned on. That's the point. So remember, those of you who just are learning, uh, you know, I've taken my class more recently. What have I said? Do not define your meditation by thinking the sound, right? Define it by letting go. Letting go of what? Letting go of our stress, letting go of our anxiety, letting go of our baggage, whatever. And letting go to allow the mind to expand outside of that eight inch plastic bucket. Let me use that analogy a million times, right? Allow the mind to expand outside of the what I sometimes call also same thing, supermarket aisle mind, outside of that focusing part of our mind to that unfocused part of our mind. So we allow the mind to just expand the container of experience, which is our conscious thinking mind. So it's not that our mind is getting bigger. Our mind is getting more awake. That's what's happening. We're waking up more of our mind to itself. That's literally much more linguistically accurate 
of what's going on. People say, oh, my mind expanded. Well, it's not your mind didn't expand. Your mind is already vast. It's just that you became more aware of the vastness of your mind. So yeah, okay, I'm not going to, you know, nitpick, but correctly, it would be more accurate to say, I woke up more of my mind to itself, right? Your mind is not. Kelvin, yeah. I've got a quick question. Sure, yeah. Um, you're talking about in the, actually I have two questions. Yeah. In the doctor's office, the dentist office, whatever, when, um, okay, Mr. Chin, it's your turn. Um, and then you don't have a chance to relax afterwards. Right, right. And relaxing, I'm finding, is almost imperative. Yeah, the resting period you're talking about. Yes. Yes, resting. yes, the resting period. Yes. That's all. And also, um, while you're meditating in the office, are you ever thinking, um, does everybody think I'm asleep here? Yeah, oh, probably oh, most people. Probably everybody thinks I'm asleep <laughs> You know, <laughs> <All right. laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'll tell you a funny story about being in France. But anyway, in a second. But, but let me ask you a question first you know, where they didn't think yes. it's sleeping. But anyway, uh, they, they, so 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 somebody says, Mr. Chin, Mr. Chin, uh, we, we, you, you know, we're ready for you now. Come in, you know, come, the chair's ready for you, whatever. OK, so what I would do. So as I would open my eyes up and go, obviously, I wouldn't say, OK, hold on, I got to take a few minutes. I'll be with you. In no, I get up and I get, you know, walk in. So I've interrupted my meditation, even if it's a meditation, quote unquote, meditation, like the way Jane and I are describing where we're not thinking the sound and everything. But you're in a meditative state is the point. Correct. That's how we're Correct. Right. Because you've let go. And that's how we're defining the meditation, as I was saying. We're, we're letting go. Right. Not about the technique. OK, so then. I go into the chair and I would sit down. They put the napkin around your neck and do all that, you know, this hoo ha that they do, right? And then I would um, uh, close my eyes again. Okay. But she might ask me a couple of questions. Oh, Mr. Chin, you know, like how long has it been since you've been here? Oh, look, I can see that on the record here. Oh, blah, blah. She might be just making some small talk with me. But then I, I typically close my eyes when I get my teeth cleaned anyway. For a couple of reasons. Number one, I just like to turn within anyway. It's another excuse. Plus, I don't like toothpaste and like spit in my eye. I have my own spit in my eyes. You know what I'm saying? So I just close my eyes. I don't know about you. You just sit there with your eyes open. You know, it's like, you know, I got toothpaste in my eye when they brush your teeth. You know, so so I do it anyway. So I just, I typically close my eyes anyway. The other thing that I do, I don't know. This is like totally kind of off topic in a sense, but I guess it sort of is. On top of it, I, I, I bring my sunglasses in. I put my sunglasses on when I when because they have that light shining in your face, you know, when you're getting your teeth worked on because they got to see in your mouth. <laughs> and it's not a it's not like a, a laser light into your mouth. It's like into your general facial air. So I, I usually have my sunglasses on anyway. And so they don't know what I'm doing. And I close my eyes and then boom, when I start not answering, you know, the, you know, if they're doing small talk. You know, by the, look, by now I know the dental hygienist. I just tell them, look, I'm going to just close my eyes and rest for a few minutes. Or sometimes they know me. I just say, I'm going to meditate. But if you don't know, I just, if here's, here's a simple tip for all of you. I have never, ever been questioned or looked at weirdly by people in the 50 years I've been meditating when I've just said to somebody, you know, I just want to close my eyes and rest for a few minutes. That's what I say to people. I don't, I don't want, if I don't want to get into like, oh, meditation, oh, what kind of meditation? Oh, what do you do when you meditate? I don't want to start a whole cascade of questions for, with them. I'll just say, uh, I'm just going to close my eyes and rest for a few minutes. Everybody shuts up. They leave you alone. Okay. When I was in France, I was sitting there meditating in ruins once, sitting in a ruins at the top. It was a beautiful it was a vista, beautiful view. And uh, some ancient Roman ruins up on the top of like a mesa, like a plateau. And uh, but it was in France. And uh, and we, we climbed up there. And there's a whole bunch of different tourists. And I said, you know, to my college buddies, I said, you know, I'm going to meditate. Uh, I sit over here and meditate. So I sat down. I'm leaning against some wall of some ancient wall or something. And I'm meditating. And I hear these French. There were a lot of French tourists, French and German tourists in this area. And so I hear they go, il est mort, il est mort. No, il s'est bronzé, il s'est bronzé. No, no, il est mort, il est mort. So if those of you who know, understand French, they're saying, he's dead, he's dead. No, he's suntanning himself. Because I was wearing, like, just I cut off 
shorts, you know, and and and, and uh, boots and socks on, and no shirt because it was hot out. Uh, he said, "No, no, he's suntanning himself, sunbathing. He's sun no, he's dead. He's dead." <laughs> I'm saying during my meditation. So anyway, good question, Seuss. That's how you handle it. I would just close my eyes as soon as I could afterwards. Remember, that's the interruption. Remember, remember in the second day I taught you. That's that's the that's how you handle that kind of interruption. You know, you, 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 um, I'm trying to remember that. No, I don't. I'm okay. sorry, but I don't. I should probably go back and um, in review now so that you now that you reminded me of that. No interruption. Um, and so what basically what you're saying mm -hmm. um, is that you can wait for the relaxation until it's convenient. Well, you want to do it, yes, but you want to do it as soon as possible. So not until it's convenient. Yes. But as soon as you can, as soon as you comfortably can. So as soon as yes, you, okay. In this case, in the dentist's office, as soon as I socially could, <laughs> without pissing, yeah, okay, without ticking off my dental hygienist, right? So yeah, <laughs> but I close my eyes as soon as I can, and just re rest period. And, and and I always recommend that if you are interrupted and you have to get up and do something, and you're interrupted like that, as opposed to what? As opposed to Hey, Steve, where are the car keys? Oh, they're on the kitchen counter. Okay, great. You know, that's a quick interrupt. It's not a big deal, right? But I'm saying you got to get up. you got to move your car. you got to get up, go get the dental hygienist chair or whatever, you know. Okay, then I extend the rest period. I say rest for 10, 15 minutes, not just, okay. not just five minutes, you know. The rest Very long. Good. Well, because you I, yeah, it's a good idea. You told, you said before, it's a good idea to rest for a bare minimum of five minutes. Yes, yes. You know, you'll see on my sheet, I'll say, okay, yeah. really press for time. You can do three, four minute rest period, but that's like squeaking by. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I prefer that all of you, and you've heard me say this a zillion times, look at five minutes as your minimum rest period. Minimum. Mm -hmm. Minimum means longer yeah. the better. Okay. You know, yeah. I've, I've told you, I rest, I rest minimum five if I'm really rushed, but my minimum usually is 10 minutes resting. And then, yeah, most of the time I'm resting, most of the time I'm resting 20 minutes, half an hour sometimes. You know, occasionally I'll rest half an hour, an hour afterwards. Not That's not my regular thing, but sometimes I will. You know, it depends how I'm feeling, if I'm a little tired, if I'm traveling, who knows what. Or I just feel like being lazy, you know, just feel like it. You go with your neurophysiology, that's the point. Hey, Pearl. Very good. See you just. Thank you. Cool. Absolutely. All right, good questions, good questions, good questions. Uh, Diane, uh, I, I'm going to talk about that after the group meditation. It's, in fact, that's one of the things that you typed to me. That's exactly what I'm going to talk about. So, perfect. It's too much psychic stuff going on in this room. Okay. It's your, I already you know, read my mind. All right. Okay, any other questions before we meditate? Keep the technique easy and simple. Remember, as I just said, do not define your meditation by Thinking the sound. Yes, we do think the sound. Yes, the sound is a, an important tool. It's an important tool. It's part of the technique. But this meditation, the way I teach it, it's not about the sound. It's not about technique. It's about letting go. That's how we define the meditation. It's about letting go and expansion of the mind and letting go of our baggage, anxiety, stress, etc. Okay? So, yeah, we do think the sound, but we think it in order to forget it. Right? What's that mean? We think it comfortably inside. We don't hold on to it, and our mind goes off of it. And if you ask me now, what's my meditation like 99% of the time, I don't even know if I think the sound. It's kind of like what you were saying, Jane. You know, you sit, you close the yeah. eyes. You, you intend to think the sound. I'm not saying you don't. I'm not saying you, 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 you intend not to think the sound. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you intend to think the sound. You intend to do the technique. But what happens is based on the thing I said at the beginning of our discussion today, the familiarity pathway developed so quickly in this process, the way I teach it, that you find that it's just like you start having meditations where I don't even know if I thought the sound, it doesn't matter. It took you where you needed to go. It turned on the parasympathetic nervous system, the opposite of the fight or flight switch, in other words. That's all we care about, all right? That's what we care about. Right. So the technique right. is, 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 is to do that, but obviously, I can't teach uh, the technique that I teach isn't okay. Close your eyes and turn on the parasympathetic. That, that's not good teaching of a technique, right? There's a technique involved with this, but it does that. That's the thing. And so once you start getting into this, 
this more uh, this pattern or this this process so easily like that that it becomes normal and natural, you're good to go. Okay, your mind is experiencing itself, and that's what this meditation is. Another way to say what this meditation is all about: allowing the mind to experience itself. Okay. All right. Cool. Anything else before we meditate, and then I'll cover a couple other points. All right. Okay. So uh, we're going to start step by step. And you, as you as you guys know, just a reminder, we don't do this on our own. We just close your eyes and then go. You know, you do your half a minute. And remember, the half a minute is not about feeling relaxed. You do not have to feel relaxed during that half a minute. And you don't have to time it. I, I don't care if it's 15, 20 seconds, 37 seconds. It doesn't matter. The exact time does not matter. What matters is you're not rushing or hurrying in your meditation. That's the sole purpose of this half a minute at the beginning. So people sometimes ask, well, what's the purpose of that? That's it. Don't rush. Don't hurry. Why? Because if you rush or hurry into the meditation and you start thinking the sound, blah, 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 then that the mind will interpret that as a focus, as a, as a subtle forcing, as effort. And what will that do? That will contract the mind. That will contract the body. That's the exact opposite of what we want. Okay? All right. So let's just sit comfortably first. Close the eyes. Let's open our eyes. And again, let's close our eyes. Again, let's open our eyes. So when we close our eyes, naturally feel some quietness, some silence inside, right? We feel some quietness inside, right? Good. Let's close our eyes again. Again, let's open our eyes. Still feel some quietness when we close the eyes, right? Everyone still feels some quietness. Yeah, good, good. And in that quietness, you probably noticed you had some thoughts pop into the mind. And when I say thoughts, I mean any mental activity of any kind, right? Everyone knows some thoughts, some mental activity. And you probably also notice how easily, how effortlessly the thoughts just pop into the mind. The mental activity is just there, right? So that's just how easily, just how effortlessly we want to think the sound. Okay, so this time when we close the eyes, just sit easily, after about half a minute or so, start to think the sound in that same easy, effortless way we think any other thought, and we'll meditate together for a little while. I'll keep track of the time. Okay, let's close the eyes.
rest for a few minutes. You can lie down and rest, or you can just continue sitting. I'll keep track of the time. Thank you. 
slowly open the eyes. So if you want to keep your eyes closed longer and rest longer, that's fine. You can always rest longer, and if you want to rest longer now, that's fine. You can just listen to me with your eyes closed. So it was easy, comfortable, yeah? Yeah, somebody said that there's somebody breathing loudly. It's the cat, Patrick. I was gonna say, it's a cat. It's a cat, it's, it's, it's Patrick. I wasn't sure, <laughs> I wasn't sure. If, could hear them. But I guess the microphones on these Apple products are very good. <laughs> it began to sound like a human after a while. No, it's definitely Patrick. It's his normal. <laughs> it's Patrick who I introduced you to at the beginning of the call. Uh, yes, he's a, he's a very loud sleeper, we'll say. <laughs> he's a deep and loud sleeper. But it was easy, the meditation, easy, comfortable. Yeah, easy, comfortable for everyone. Yep. Yeah. Good. Keep it easy and simple. Remember, just the normal, natural process of thinking the sound and then basically taking it as it comes. You know, basically, what does that mean? That means whatever happens, happens. We just let whatever happens, happens. When we realize we're off the sound, we just easily, gently come back to it. That's it. Okay. Keep the process very, very simple. All right. And as you know, doesn't matter if you feel deep or not in your meditation. It's not about that. You, sometimes you'll feel deeper than other times. doesn't matter. You always take enough time, as Seuss was pointing out at the beginning, how important or critically important he notices in the, 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 the resting period on the back end is. Right? So we lie down and rest whenever we can. If it's comfortable, convenient where you are, or if you're meditating in a car or in the library or hotel lobby or something, obviously airport lounge, you're in a public place, you don't want to make a big scene. So you rest with your eyes closed sitting. That's okay. But whenever I can, I always like to lie down and rest afterwards. And it just kind of, it's like an extra level of letting go again, you know, when you lie down. Um, Stevie, who's on the call right now, some of my friends, we've been meditating for you know, literally almost 50 years together. We get together, we haven't seen each other in a while, sometimes for months or years. We'll meditate together, and somebody inevitably will jokingly say, uh, it's all about the rest period. You know, the best part's the rest period. <laughs> we kind of jokingly say it, but it is. It's a great, very important, integral part. And those of you who've taken my class know how much a big deal is I make of, 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 of the rest period, because it's a, it's a time when we integrate, we make permanent, in other words, the benefits, the effects of the meditation by resting long enough after our meditation. We're not just jumping up out of the meditation. So resting long helps make permanent, and in that sense, integrates those effects into the fabric of our nervous system. Well, that's what we want, into the, into the, you know, the interstices, these little, you know, whatevers of our mind, you know, the, the effects, the, the, the wakefulness, the the consciousness, the, the expansion of the mind in that way, okay? And we can hear, you can probably hear that Patrick has woken up. <laughs> Patrick is talking. Um, okay, so let's talk about a couple other points I want to touch on before we uh, end the session today. One is, uh, I'm going to get very kind of nitty-gritty in terms of health and healing, and then I'm going to talk about another point in terms of more, more spiritual point, kind of more mental expansion point. So let's talk about the health and healing point, first of all. And that's that Diane raised this point to me in a, in, a, in, a, in a chat room note. And the idea of benefit, somebody's rattling around, if you could mute your phone, that would be great. Um, so the healing benefits of the meditation, really, really important. So if you're feeling sick, you've got a head cold, you've got the flu, you, or if you're 
you know, unfortunately in the hospital laid up, you know, you got some surgery going on or you just, you just, you know, you're going to be, you, you, you're not, you're not, you're, you're out of sorts uh, in, in the sense neurophysiologically and your health is then, you know, manifesting some sort of illness in some way, then absolutely you meditate extra. Okay. And when I say extra, I don't care how many times, more times you meditate. It really doesn't matter. Um, as much as you feel comfortable, okay, that's the thing. And now sometimes people will think, wow, as much as I feel comfortable, what does that mean I can meditate 500 times a day? Wow. And it's like, yeah, well, yeah, in theory, but in practice, it, it doesn't happen because what happens is if you're feeling sick or if you have, uh, you're in the hospital and you're, you know, you're under various you know, drugs that are sedating you and this and that, then then what happens is you will sleep for a while and then you'll meditate and you'll sleep for a while and you'll meditate for a couple of few minutes. You'll conk out and sleep for an hour, two hours. You wake up, you meditate for a few minutes and then you conk out and fall asleep. So there's an incredibly powerful healing effect of that kind of alternating back and forth, meditating and sleeping, meditating and sleeping. Sometimes I uh, you know, one of my one of my students years ago came up with this coined this phrase mednapping. So mednap, we're going to do a mednap because she she knew that she because she was in school at the time she knew that she was tired and she would probably fall asleep. She was nursing nursing school at the time it was pretty intense. She probably would say, oh, okay, I'm going to meditate and I'll probably fall asleep. So whether she did or did she didn't, she always say, I'm going to go to mednap. So she would meditate and sometimes nap. That kind of alternating back and forth, and of course, in that situation, she was not sick, like I'm talking about in terms of the healing benefits of extra meditation. But that's another variation on the same theme. The point is that going is that the sleeping becomes so incredibly healing when you fall asleep during or after the meditation, or both. It doesn't matter. And another way of saying the same thing that I just started articulating recently in the last month or two, uh, literally in the last couple of months, um, a, a very dear friend of mine is in the hospital and, uh, you know, I was saying this to her about meditating extra like this and so forth. And I had this epiphany that it's like, you know, what we're doing when, when we're promoting that, essentially what we're doing is we're consciously creating a, a, a kind of a coma effect in a sense in the neurophysiology and some of some of you may know uh friends or you know i don't know if you have ever personally experienced this in the hospital setting where they will medically induce a coma in some people and they will medically induce the coma one of the reasons they'll medically induce the coma is to promote healing so that the person is not tossing and turning and kind of you know just in that kind of fitful uh waking semi-sleeping state, not even sleeping deeply, they'll medically induce a coma. They'll put the people under intentionally in order to heal. Well, I thought about that and I thought, you know, that's what kind of you're doing. Because I remember when I, I haven't been sick like that in decades, but I remember when I was 19, 20 years old and I got sick and I got, a, I was, you know, I, and I was meditating and sleeping and meditating and sleeping. I'm in kind of this semi-conscious state, almost like a coma, in a sense, where I'm really under, if you want to use that phrase, kind of not fully wakefully conscious state. I'm really way underneath that the whole time. Even if I get up to go to the bathroom quickly, I'm not in a wide awake, sharp mental state. I'm in a much more... Uh, turn down physical physiologic uh, state okay so um, you know that's what I mean when I say I'm, it's not a literally literally you're in a coma I say it's kind of figuratively but you're almost in a kind of consciously induced coma co coma kind of state the point is that you're in a very deep healing state when you meditate extra like that and you're feeling a little off or as in my, my dear friend's uh, situation where she was in the hospital, 
And uh, I d it's very important to meditate a lot in those situations because I don't know if those of you have ever been in a hospital situation overnight. I mean, I've been in and out for quick, you know, you know, minor little surgery or something, uh, you know, for a couple few hours. But if you're overnight, it's just, it's not a it's it's not the ideal place to be sleeping. They're coming and interrupting you all the time. There's people clanking and walking in the hallways. And I know we have a doctor on the call right now, and you know, I know he would corroborate this. Uh, that you know, it's it's just you know, a lot of the medical personnel bless them the, in the healing work that they're doing are not real conscious of the patients and the patients needs quite frankly and they're talking loudly in the hallway they're clanking and pushing machinery and da 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 da, da down the hallway at two o'clock three o'clock in the morning and i know that because i've been in hospitals with loved ones at two or three in the morning going what well, you know and but you know then if i'm there then i go out and i intervene and i ask the medical personnel to be shh you know, could you be a little bit quieter? You know, somebody's sleeping right here. Hello, McFly. You know, um, anyway, you know, ideally you want to shut the door, but sometimes you can't. And sometimes you're in a room with somebody else who is, you're sharing a room and that other person is, uh, has medical personnel, understandably working on them next to you. You're sleeping is the point. You're sleeping is not deep. You're not getting deep, 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 uh, rest, uh, during your hospital stays when you're overnight and God forbid you're there for more than one day, you know, you're definitely getting sleep deprived. Um, not to mention you're all drugged up and so forth, which also affects your, your, um, your sleeping, your normal sleep, uh, mechanisms. So all the more reason in those situations, meditate extra. That's the bottom, bottom line. Okay. As much as you can, as much as you feel, it'll accelerate the healing hugely. Okay. Questions on that before I, Cover the last point I wanted to cover today. Okay. Um, you know, a minor variation on that is if you just get a lousy night's sleep for whatever reason, you know. Uh, you know, Patrick the cat, it's probably not Patrick. Patrick sleeps like a log, as you could hear. But it's, you know, one of the younger cats that's here in the house is up and it's just like scratching at the door or something or who knows what. Uh, even though you close your bedroom door and they, you know, you're up, who knows, you know, whatever it is, or maybe I know some of you have babies. So, you know, I mean, not cat babies, but I mean, you have human babies. <laughs> I mean, you've got like, you know, whatever. It's just, you, you, or, or for whatever reason, you just don't get a good night's sleep. You can meditate extra the next day. Feel free to do that. Okay. Is it going to completely replace uh, the sleep that you missed? Not completely, but it's certainly going to help. All right. So you're going to be a little bit flexible with that. You can meditate extra every once in a while like that, but I don't want you to get into a routine of doing it three or four times a day every day. All right. Why? Because we don't want to release too much too quickly. And some of you are uh, on the call or, you know, a couple of few of you are, are some of my higher anxiety clients. And so you know that I have your meditation time cut back and I have your rest period increased. And so this is a little uh, educational or a teaching point for everybody on the call. If any of you, even if you're not experiencing high anxiety. Um, so I experienced this. I'll just use myself, self-disclosure. I've been through five layoffs in my life since I was 50 years old. Now I'm doing my nonprofit work full-time, as you know, so that, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to be laying myself off. But, but um, you know, it's very stressful. And when I went through those really, really, really stressful periods in my life where I was out of work for a year, year and a half, almost two years one time, it was terrible when you're trying to support a family of four. All right, so what would happen during my meditations? What would I do? I would, in those higher anxiety states that I was in at those times, I cut back my meditation time, I increased my rest period. Okay, so any of you, if you ever go into a period in that, of that in your life, I hope you never do. But if you do, note, note that you can modulate, adjust, you, 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 you decrease your meditation time a little bit, increase your rest period on the back end. All right. If you ever start feeling so anxious that it feels uncomfortable in your waking state, that's the, that's the, the uh, yardstick is how do you feel when your eyes are open? If you feel a little bit off, you might want to, sh you know, you know, you know, turn back uh, the dial a little bit on how many minutes you're meditating and increase your rest period. All right. That's always a good, uh, a good rule of thumb. Okay. Questions, anything before we continue? 
anything at all. Okay, so let's talk about kind of the, the more spiritual uh, teaching point that I want to raise. You've heard me use the phrase, increase the conscious capacity of our mind. All right. And you've heard me. You've heard me use uh, the, the you know the analogy of expanding the mind outside of that little eight-inch plastic bucket that people incorrectly think that their mind is limited to. That their mind is just this focusing part of their mind. That's what we call the eight-inch plastic bucket in this analogy. No, that their mind is much more vast. That's the truth. The mind is much more vast than that. It's huge. It's vast. Okay. Um, this whole notion of uh, increasing the conscious capacity for experience and uh, allowing the mind to experience itself in this very different way from the from 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 what we're used to experiencing in waking, dreaming, and sleeping is is what I'm referring to. As sometimes I refer to it as at the longer range effects of the meditation technique as we continue meditating just consistently every day, ideally twice a day. Okay. Um, but here's the thing. Sometimes I, I clarify that for people because people are like, what does that mean by allowing the mind to experience itself um, in this different way, the different structure of experience? You'll hear me use that phrase sometimes, that, that what we're doing long term, long range by meditating in the way that I, I've taught you is that we're changing the structure of how we experience. We're not changing the experience. So that's why I disabuse all of you. Remember, you, you notice I spend very, 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 very little time talking about experience or experiences that you may have during your meditation. No, it's not about the experiences you're having during meditation. It's about we're changing the structure of experience. So this is a fundamental, really basic difference from the way I teach meditation and the way 99% of the meditation teachers out there teach. Okay. Because they get into experience and they're talking about, oh, how you feel? Oh, that's a great experience. Oh, this is a great experience. Even when I taught that other technique that I taught in the 70s, there was a lot of discussion about, oh, get to the, get up to the microphone and tell people oh, what you experienced. What was your experience like? Blah, 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 blah. I don't do that. The reason I don't do that is because even though we did say back then when I taught that it's not about experience, you don't cognitively do something that's dissonant. In other words, you don't then do behavior that's inconsistent and have people get up at a microphone and then talk about their experiences. Well, you just told people that it's not about the experience, but, oh, let's talk about experience. Oh, that's a wonderful experience. Oh, that's a great. So, what, so you don't hear me do that in my classes, right? Because I try to walk the talk here and match up the teaching with the behavior that we, pro that, that we promote, okay? So the promotion of the behavior is just meditate and forget about it. That's what I tell people, right? Forget about it. It doesn't matter what your experience is. Just go about your life. And if you do that, what does that do? That simple formula of meditating consistently and then forgetting about it. We don't have to analyze the meditations. Don't have to keep journals, whatever. No, just forget about it. What does that do? That promotes changing the structure of how we experience. Now, what the example of that, what does that mean? Changing the structure of experience sounds very abstract, and it is somewhat abstract in the, when we describe it that way. But here's a very clear example of what that means. What's the, the structure of experience is different from dreaming and waking state, right? We have a different structure of experience in dreaming and waking. Yes, you may have different experiences in dreaming and waking, but you can have the same experience in dreaming and waking. For example, in dreaming, uh, last night I was dreaming about driving a car. Okay, great. I'm dreaming about driving a car. In the dream, I'm dreaming about driving the car. And all of a sudden, I think it's because we were watching a movie, you know, he was driving the car or he was hitchhiking across the country, right, the other day. And so I'm dreaming about driving, you know, he's in a car and the people are driving a car or he's driving a car or whatever. Um, or I'm driving a car in the dream. And then um, the car all of a sudden changes colors. It's a different car. First it was a convertible, and now it's not a convertible. It's a wholly different car. And who knows? In some dreams, the car can even change into a horse, or it could change into a flower pot. It could change into different things in a dream, right? The, the experience is the experience of driving the car. The structure of experience is weird sometimes in dreaming. In waking state, our car is not going to turn into a horse. 
We know that in, in waking state, right? It's a different structure of experience. The experience is, we could describe it as, okay, we're driving a car and dreaming, we're driving a car in waking state. Same experience in the sense, but different structure of experience, so that changes the whole experience in a sense, right? So that's what I'm saying is what we're doing just by meditating and forgetting about it. But the consistency of the meditation is the idea that I talked about at the outset, at the beginning of our call today, right? Of regularly doing it, and creating that familiarity of the pathways and the neurons and so forth in the brain, blah, 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 all that stuff, okay? But that consistently develops, consistency develops the familiarity, which develops this change in the structure of how we experience life. And when I say change in the structure of experience, how we experience life, I'm not just talking about waking state. I'm talking about this change in the structure of how we experience dreaming, sleeping, waking state, anything in between. Okay? That's the power of the way I'm teaching the technique now and trying to make things consistent so that we don't talk about experience. You don't hear me talk about experience. Like if you have an experience that you want to have a question about, that's different from me encouraging you to tell about experiences, okay? So certainly you all know, and you've sometimes asked me about experience you may have had during your meditation. That's totally 100% fine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm putting, I'm talking about not putting a value, a judgment on the types of experiences that we're having during meditation. That completely 100% doesn't matter at all, okay? Questions on that? really important fundamental practical stuff in what I just said, okay? Because it's all about, you talk about spirituality, well, you want to talk about the ultimate spirituality, what is it? It's about allowing ourselves to experience as much of ourselves as we possibly can. That's what spirituality is. Uh, I don't care, you could talk about it from this angle or that angle or this angle or that angle, you can slice and dice that in different ways, you can package it linguistically in different ways, uh, you can write a book about this aspect or that aspect about what I just said. But what I said is what all spirituality is about. It's about, and to me, from my, from my standpoint, that's what, that's what life is about, is experiencing more of myself and then playing with that in the field of change, which is the field that we live in, Right in this waking, dreaming field of change that we live in, of course, primarily waking, when I'm interaction, interacting with you and others, and other loved ones, friends, colleagues, and so forth, right? Playing with it in the sense of manipulating what I know about myself in this field of change as I know and learn more about myself, manipulating it in a different way. To me, that's what living life is. That's what... That's the fun of that's the fun way I look at it now. A little bit different from the way I looked at it maybe when I was a teenager. <laughs> After a few years. Right, Suze? Okay. Questions? No, yes, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> right? Cool. Any questions? Let hey, me Kelvin. I got some text. Kelvin, first thing I want to thank you. Absolutely. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. You're very welcome. Um, so here, I got, I got a, a comment here. I want to read to everybody. Tidbit of the vastness of the brain. This is from my doctor client here. Who's on the call. Tidbit of the vastness of the brain. 100 billion neurons in the brain can contain 100 terabytes of information. A typical PC has less than one terabyte of memory capacity. So 1 billion, 100, billion, 100 billion neurons in the brain contain 100 terabytes of information. And that's just the brain we're talking about. So yes, the brain is part of who we are. There's no question about that, okay? Um, and consistent rehab promotes neuron, uh, neuronal plasticity the same way stroke patients recover their function. Yep. Yeah. And so consistent rehab, uh, what he's calling consistent rehab, I'm calling is what meditation does. It increases our brain capacity. We actually create more brain cells uh, based on med meditation in the studies that they've noticed. Uh, and he says, but yeah, they need to do it consistently for those neurons to make new connections. So see, so he's, 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 he's uh, uh, my doctor client here 
Alan is supporting what I'm saying. It's about the consistency of the meditation by creating, by consistently reminding our minds, our brains, our minds. No, so we can look at it as brain, physical, and we could also look at it as mind consciousness. I don't care how you look at it. You, you know, some some people like my father didn't believe that there was anything called mind or consciousness. He just believed in brain. I said, fine, that's okay. And he meditated his whole, you know, not his whole life, but he meditated for you know the last almost 30 years of his life, he meditated. So, um, you know, he died, he was 80. And so he meditated from 50 to 80 years old. And so, yeah, you know, it, it, uh, it, it, I don't care how you look at it. Brain, mind, I don't care. doesn't matter. We are creating more brain cells. We are expanding the mind outside of that conscious capacity, that limited conscious, uh, conscious, uh, conscious eight-inch plastic bucket area that we think that the mind is. It's not. It's more vast than that. And we're creating more brain cells. Thanks for that, Alan. It's a great point. Any other, let's see, any other points? Let's see, any other, hold on, let me see. Text, anything else? Okay. Questions, questions, comments, anything else? Okie doke. All righty, folks. Great to have all of you on. You know how to reach me. Anybody wants to meditate with me privately, you know how to reach me, okay? Just text me, email me, whatever. And like I said, um, I'll be on the West Coast until the 28th of December, and then I'll uh, be back on the East Coast for a period of time. I'll be back and forth. Um, so I'm not moving to the East Coast, but I'll be bi-coastal. I'm keeping my place in L.A., et cetera, and, um, uh, but I'll be in the Eastern Seaboard. So those of you who want to... Uh, get together with me face to face. Let me know. Um, maybe help me set up some talks and so forth. That would be fun. Even in your living room. Even in your living room. Informal. Just a group of friends. Whatever. I'll uh, take the train up. Drive up. Depending on where you are. So forth. Um, and uh, we'll get together. It'll be fun. Okay? Great. Talk to you again. See you soon. Thank you, Calvin. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Calvin. Well, I'll Thank text you. you. Bye -bye. I'll text. But thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Okay. Welcome. Okay. Soon. Okay. Bye-bye. 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 See you, folks. Good to see you, Mike. Pearl. Great. Take care. John. They can hear Patrick. Oh, yeah. They can hear Patrick's.